Lecture 5 of The Fairyland of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairyland of Science by Arabella Buckley. Lecture 5 The Two Great Sculptors Water and Ice. In our last lecture, we saw that water can exist in three forms first, as an invisible vapor second as liquid water, third as solid snow and ice. Today we are going to take the two last of these forms, water and ice, and speak of them as sculptors. To understand why they deserve this name, we must first consider what the work of a sculptor is. If you go into a statuary yard, you will find there large blocks of granite, marble, and other kinds of stone, hewn roughly into different shapes. But if you pass into the studio, where the sculptor himself is at work, you will find beautiful statues, more or less finished, and you will see that out of rough blocks of stone he has been able to cut images which look like living forms. You can even see by their faces whether they are intended to be sad, or thoughtful, or gay, and by their attitude whether they are writhing in pain, or dancing with joy, or resting peacefully. How has all this history been worked out from the shapeless stone? It has been done by a sculptor's chisel. A piece chipped off here, a wrinkle cut there a smooth surface rounded off in another place so as to give a gentle curve. All these touches gradually shape the figure and mold it out of the rough stone, first into a rude shape, and afterwards, by delicate strokes, into the form of a living being. Now just in the same way as the wrinkles and curves of a statue are cut by the sculptor's chisel, so the hills and valleys, the steep slopes and gentle curves on the face of our earth, giving it all its beauty, and the varied landscapes we love so well, have been cut out by water and ice passing over them. It is true that some of the greater wrinkles of the earth, the lofty mountains, and the high masses of land which rise above the sea, have been caused by earthquakes and the shrinking of the earth. We shall not speak of these to-day, but put them aside as belonging to the rough work of the statuary yard. But when once these large masses are put ready for water to work upon, then all the rest of the rugged wrinkles and gentle slopes which make the country so beautiful are due to water and ice, and for this reason I have called them sculptors. Go for a walk in the country, or notice the landscape as you travel on a railway journey. You pass by hills and through valleys, through narrow steep gorges cut in hard rock, or through wild ravines up the sides of which you can hardly scramble. Then you come to grassy slopes and to smooth plains across which you can look for miles without seeing a hill. Or when you arrive at the seashore, you clamber into caves and grottoes, and along dark narrow passages leading from one bay to another. All these, hills, valleys, gorges, ravines, slopes, plains, caves, grottoes, and rocky shores, have been cut out by the water. Day by day, and year by year, while everything seems to us to remain the same, this industrious sculptor is chipping away, a few grains here, a corner there, a large mass in another place, till he gives to the country its own peculiar scenery, just as the human sculptor gives expression to his statue. Our work today will consist in trying to form some idea of the way in which water thus carves out the surface of the earth, and we will begin by seeing how much can be done by our friends, the raindrops, before they become running streams. Everyone must have noticed that whenever rain falls on soft ground, it makes small round holes in which it collects, and then it sinks into the ground, forcing its way between the grains of earth. But you would hardly think that the beautiful pillars in figure 24 have been made entirely in this way, by rain beating upon and soaking into the ground. Where these pillars stand there was once a solid mass of clay and stones, into which the raindrops crept, loosening the earthly particles, and then when the sun dried the earth again cracks were formed, so that the next shower loosened it still more, and carried some of the mud down into the valley below. But here and there large stones were buried in the clay, and where this happened the rain could not penetrate, and the stones became the tops of tall pillars of clay, washed into shape by the rain beating on its sides, but escaping the general destruction of the rest of the mud. In this way the whole valley has been carved out into fine pillars, some still having capping stones, while others have lost them, and these last will soon be washed away. We have no such valleys of earth pillars here in England, but you may sometimes see tiny pillars under bridges, where the drippings have washed away the earth between the pebbles, and such small examples which you can observe for yourselves are quite as instructive as the more important ones. 
Another way in which rain changes the surface of the earth is by sinking down through loose soil from the top of a cliff to a depth of many feet till it comes to solid rock, and then lying spread out over a wide space. Here it makes a kind of watery mud, which is a very unsafe foundation for the hill of earth above it, and so, after a time, the whole mass slips down and becomes a fresh piece of land at the foot of the cliff. If you have ever been at the Isle of Wight, you will have seen an undulating strip of ground, called the Undercliff, at Ventnor, and other places, stretching along the sea below the high cliffs. This land was once at the top of the cliff, and came down by succession of landslips such as we have been describing. A very great landslip of this kind happened in the memory of living people, at Lyme Regis, in Dorsetshire, in the year 1839. You will easily see how in forming earth pillars and causing landslips, rain changes the face of the country. But these are only rare effects of water. It is when the rain collects in brooks and forms rivers that it is most busy in sculpturing the land. Look out some day into the road or the garden where the ground slopes a little, and watch what happens during a shower of rain. First the raindrops run together in every little hollow of the ground. Then the water begins to flow along any ruts or channels it can find, lying here and there in pools, but always making its way gradually down the slope. Meanwhile, from other parts of the ground, little rills are coming, and these meet in some larger ruts where the ground is lowest, making one great stream, which at last empties itself into the gutter or an area, or finds its way down some grating. Now just this, which we can watch whenever a heavy shower of rain comes down on the road, happens also all over the world. Up in the mountains, where there is always a great deal of rain, little rills gather and fall over the mountainsides, meeting in some stream below. Then, as this stream flows on, it is fed by many runnels of water, which come from all parts of the country, trickling along ruts, and flowing in small brooks and rivulets, down the gentle slope of the land, till they reach the big stream, which at last is important enough to be called a river. Sometimes this river comes to a large hollow in the land, and there the water gathers and forms a lake. But still, at the lower end of this lake, out it comes again, forming a new river, and growing and growing by receiving fresh streams, until at last it reaches the sea. The River Thames, which you all know, and whose course you will find clearly described in Mr. Huxley's physiography, drains in this way no less than one-seventh of the whole of England. All the rain which falls in Berkshire, Oxfordshire, Middlesex, Herefordshire, Surrey, the north of Wiltshire, and northwest of Kent, the south of Buckinghamshire, and of Gloucestershire, finds its way into the Thames making an area of 6,160 square miles, over which every rivulet and brook trickle down to the one great river, which bears them to the ocean. And so, with every other area of land in the world, there is some one channel towards which the ground on all sides slopes gently down, and into this channel all the water will run on its way to the sea. But what has this to do with sculpture or cutting out of valleys? If you will only take a glass of water out of any river, and let it stand for some hours, you will soon answer this question for yourself. For you will find that even from river water which looks quite clear, a thin layer of mud will fall to the bottom of the glass, and if you take the water when the river is swollen and muddy, you will get quite a thick deposit. This shows that the brooks, the streams, and the rivers wash away the land as they flow over it, and carry it from the mountains down to the valleys, and from the valleys away out into the sea. But besides earthly matter, which we can see, there is much matter dissolved in the water of rivers, as we mentioned in the last lecture, and this we cannot see. If you use water which comes out of a chalk country, you will find that after a time the kettle in which you have been in the habit of boiling this water has a hard crust on its bottom and sides, and this crust is made of chalk, or carbonate of lime, which the water took out of the rocks when it was passing through them. Professor Bischoff has calculated that the river Rhine carries past Bonn every year enough carbonate of lime dissolved in its water to make 332,000 million oyster shells, and if all these shells were built into a cube, it would measure 560 feet. Imagine to yourselves the whole of St. Paul's churchyard filled with oyster shells, built up in a large square till they reached half as high again as the top of the cathedral. Then you will have some idea of the amount of chalk carried invisibly past Bonn in the water of the Rhine every year. Since all this matter, whether brought down as mud or dissolved, comes from one part of the land to be carried elsewhere, or out to sea, it is clear that some gaps and hollows must be left in the places from which it is taken. Let us see how these gaps are made. 
Have you ever clambered up the mountainside, or even up one of those small ravines in the hillside, which have generally a little stream trickling through them? If so, you must have noticed the number of pebbles, large and small, lying in patches here and there in the stream, and many pieces of broken rock, which are often scattered along the sides of the ravine, and how, as you climb, the path grows steeper, and the rocks become rugged and stick out in strange shapes. The history of this ravine will tell us a great deal about the carving of water. Once it was nothing more than a little furrow in the hillside, down which the rain found its way in a thin, thread-like stream. But by and by, as the stream carried down some of the earth, and the furrow grew deeper and wider, the sides began to crumble when the sun dried up the rain which had soaked in. Then, in winter, when the sides of the hill were moist with the autumn rains, frost came and turned the water to ice, and so made the cracks still larger, and the swollen stream rushing down caught the loose pieces of rock and washed them down into its bed. Here they were rolled over and over, and grated against each other, and were ground away until they became rounded pebbles, such as lie in the foreground of the picture, figure 25, while the grit which was rubbed off them was carried farther down the stream. And so in time this became a little valley, and as the stream cut it deeper and deeper, there was room to clamber along the sides of it, and ferns and mosses began to cover the naked stone, and small trees rooted themselves along the banks, and this beautiful little nook sprang up on the hillside, entirely by the sculpturing of water. Shall you not feel a fresh interest in all the little valleys, ravines, and gorges you meet with in the country, if you can picture them being formed in this way year by year? There are many curious differences in them which you can study for yourselves. Some will be smooth, broad valleys, and here the rocks have been soft and easily worn, and water trickling down the sides of the first valley has cut other channels so as to make smaller valleys running across it. In other places there will be narrow ravines, and here the rocks have been hard, so that they did not wear away gradually, but broke off and fell in blocks, leaving high cliffs on each side. In some places you will come to a beautiful waterfall, where the water has tumbled over a steep cliff, and then eaten its way back, just like a saw cutting through a piece of wood. There are two things in particular to notice in a waterfall like this. First, how the water and spray dash against the bottom of the cliff down which it falls, and grind the small pebbles against the rock. In this way the bottom of the cliff is undermined, and so great pieces tumble down from time to time, and keep the fall upright instead of its being sloped away at the top and becoming a mere stream. Secondly, you may often see curious cup-shaped holes, called potholes, in the rocks on the sides of a waterfall, and these also are concerned in its formation. In these holes you will generally find two or three small pebbles, and you have here a beautiful example of how water uses stones to grind away the face of the earth. These holes are made entirely by the falling water eddying round and round in a small hollow of the rock, and grinding the pebbles which it has brought down, against the bottom and sides of this hollow, just as you grind round a pestle in a mortar. By degrees the hole grows deeper and deeper, and though the first pebbles are probably ground down to powder, others fall in, and so in time there is a great hole perforated right through, helping to make the rock break and fall away. In this and other ways the water works its way back in a surprising manner. The Isle of Wight gives us some good instances of this. Alum Bay Chine and the celebrated Black Gang Chine have been entirely cut out by waterfalls. But the best known and most remarkable example is the Niagara Falls in America. Here the river Niagara first wanders through a flat country, and then reaches the Great Lake Erie in a hollow of the plain. After that it flows gently down for about fifteen miles, and then the slope becomes greater, and it rushes onto the falls of Niagara. These falls are not nearly so high as many people imagine, being only about 165 feet, or about half the height of St. Paul's Cathedral, but they are 2,700 feet or nearly half a mile wide, and no less than 670,000 tons of water fall over them every minute, making magnificent clouds of spray. Sir Charles Lyell, when he was at Niagara, came to the conclusion that, taking one year with another, these falls eat back the cliff at the rate of about one foot a year, as you can easily imagine they would do, when you think with what force the water must dash against the bottom of the falls. In this way a deep cleft has been cut right back from Queenstown, for a distance of seven miles, to the place where the falls are now. This helps us a little to understand how very slowly and gradually water cuts its way, for if a foot a year is about the average of the waste of the rock, it will have taken more than thirty-five thousand years for that channel of seven miles to be made. 
But even this chasm cut by the falls of Niagara is nothing compared with the canyons of Colorado. Canyon is a Spanish word for a rocky gorge, and these gorges are indeed so grand that if we had not seen in other places what water can do, we should never have been able to believe that it could have cut out these gigantic chasms. For more than three hundred miles the river Colorado, coming down from the Rocky Mountains, has eaten its way through a country made of granite and hard beds of limestone and sandstone, and it has cut down straight through these rocks, leaving walls from half a mile to a mile high, standing straight up from it. The cliffs of the Great Canyon, as it is called, stretch up for more than a mile above the river which flows in the gorge below. Fancy yourselves for a moment in a boat on this river, as shown in figure 27, and looking up at these gigantic walls of rock towering above you. Even halfway up them, a man, if he could get there, would be so small you could not see him without a telescope, while the opening at the top between the two walls would seem so narrow at such an immense distance that the sky above would have the appearance of nothing more than a narrow streak of blue. Yet these huge chasms have not been made by any violent breaking apart of the rocks or convulsion of an earthquake. No, they have been gradually, silently, and steadily cut through by the river, which now glides quietly in the wire chasms, or rushes rapidly through the narrow gorges at their feet. No description, says Lieutenant Ives, one of the first explorers of this river, can convey the idea of the varied and majestic grandeur of this peerless waterway. Wherever the river turns, the entire panorama changes. Stately facades, august cathedrals, amphitheaters, rotundas, castellated walls, and rows of time-stained ruins, surmounted by every form of tower, minaret, dome, and spire, have been molded from the cyclopean masses of rock that form the mighty defile. Who will say, after this, that water is not the grandest of all sculptors, as it cuts through the hundreds of miles of rock, forming such magnificent granite groups, not only unsurpassed, but unequalled by any of the works of man. But we must not look upon water only as a cutting instrument, for it does more than merely carve out land in one place. It also carries it away and lays it down elsewhere, and in this it is more like a modeler in clay, who smooths off the material from one part of his figure to put it upon another. Running water is not only always carrying away mud, but at the same time laying it down here and there wherever it flows. Whenever a torrent brings down stones and gravel from the mountains, it will depend on the size and weight of the pieces how long they will be in falling through the water. If you take a handful of gravel and throw it into a glass full of water, you will notice that the stones in it will fall to the bottom at once. The grit and coarse sand will take longer in sinking, and lastly the fine sand will be an hour or two in settling down, so that the water becomes clear. Now suppose that this gravel were sinking in the water of a river. The stones would be buoyed up as long as the river was very full and flowed very quickly, but they would drop through sooner than the coarse sand. The coarse sand in its turn would begin to sink as the river flowed more slowly, and would reach the bottom while the fine sand was still borne on. Lastly, the fine sand would sink through very, very slowly, and only settle in comparatively still water. From this it will happen that stones will generally lie near to the bottom of torrents at the foot of the banks from which they fall, while the gravel will be carried on by the stream after it leaves the mountains. This too, however, will be laid down when the river comes into a more level country and runs more slowly, or it may be left together with the finer mud in the lake, as in the Lake of Geneva, into which the Rhone flows laden with mud and comes out at the other end clear and pure. But if no lake lies in the way, the finer earth will still travel on, and the river will take up more and more as it flows, till at last it will leave this too on the plains across which it moves sluggishly along, or will deposit it at its mouth when it joins the sea. You all know the history of the Nile, how, when the rains fall very heavily in March and April, in the mountains of Abyssinia, the river comes rushing down and brings with it a load of mud, which it spreads out over the Nile Valley in Egypt. This annual layer of mud is so thin that it takes a thousand years for it to become two or three feet deep. But besides that which falls in the valley, a great deal is taken to the mouth of the river, and there forms new land, making what is called the delta of the Nile. Alexandria, Rosetta, and Damietta are towns which are all built on land made of Nile mud, which was carried down ages and ages ago, and which has now become firm and hard like the rest of the country. You will easily remember other deltas mentioned in books, and all these are made of the mud carried down from the land to the sea. The delta of the Ganges and Brahmaputra in India is actually as large as the whole of England and Wales, 58,311 square miles. 
and the river Mississippi in America drains such a large tract of country that its delta grows, Mr. Geike tells us, at the rate of eighty-six yards in a year. All this new land laid down in Egypt, in India, in America, and in other places is the work of water. Even on the Thames you may see mud banks, as at Gravesend, which are made of earth brought from the interior of England. But at the mouth of the Thames the sea washes up very strongly every tide, and so it carries most of the mud away, and prevents a delta growing up there. If you will look about when you are at the seaside, and notice whether a stream flows down into the sea, you may even see little miniature deltas being formed there, though the sea generally washes them away again in a few hours, unless the place is well sheltered. This, then, is what becomes of the earth carried down by rivers. Either on plains, or in lakes, or in the sea, it falls down to form new land. But what becomes of the dissolved chalk and other substances? We have seen that a great deal of it is used by river and sea animals to build their shells and skeletons, and some of it is left on the surface of the ground by springs when the water evaporates. It is this carbonate of lime which forms a hard crust over anything upon which it may happen to be deposited, and then these things are called petrified. But it is in the caves and hollows of the earth that this dissolved matter is built up into the most beautiful forms. If you have ever been to Buxton in Derbyshire, you will probably have visited a cavern called Poole's Cavern, not far from there, which when you enter it looks as if it were built up entirely of rods of beautiful, transparent white glass, hanging from the ceiling, from the walls, or rising up from the floor. In this cavern, and many others like it, see the picture at the head of the lecture, water comes dripping through the roof, and as it falls, carbonate of lime forms itself into a thin white film on the roof, often making a complete circle, and then, as the water drips from it day by day, it goes on growing and growing, till it forms a long needle-shaped or tube-shaped rod, hanging like an icicle. These rods are called stalactites, and they are so beautiful, as their minute crystals glisten when a light is taken into the cavern, that one of them near Tenby is called the fairy chamber. Meanwhile, the water which drips on to the floor also leaves some carbonate of lime where it falls, and this forms a pillar, growing up towards the roof, and often the hanging stalactites and the rising pillars, called stalagmites, meet in the middle and form one column. And thus we see that underground, as well as above ground, water moulds beautiful forms in the crust of the earth. At Adelsburg, near Trieste, there is a magnificent stalactite grotto made of a number of chambers, one following another, with a river flowing through them, and the famous Mammoth Cave of Kentucky, more than ten miles long, is another example of these wonderful limestone caverns. But we have not yet spoken of the sea, and this surely is not idle in altering the shape of the land. Even the waves themselves in a storm wash against the cliffs and bring down stones and pieces of rock onto the shore below, and they help to make cracks and holes in the cliffs, for as they dash with force against them, they compress the air which lies in the joints of the stone, and cause it to force the rock apart, and so larger cracks are made, and the cliff is ready to crumble. It is, however, the stones and sand and pieces of rock lying at the foot of the cliff which are most active in wearing it away. Have you never watched the waves breaking upon a beach in a heavy storm? How they catch up the stones and hurl them down again, grinding them against each other. At high tide in such a storm, these stones are thrown against the foot of the cliff, and each blow does something towards knocking away part of the rock, till at last, after many storms, the cliff is undermined and large pieces fall down. These pieces are in their turn ground down to pebbles, which serve to batter against the remaining rock. Professor Geike tells us that the waves beat in a storm against the Bell Rock Lighthouse with as much force as if you dashed a weight of three tons against every square inch of the rock, and Stevenson found stones of two tons weight which had been thrown, during storms, right over the ledge of the lighthouse. Think what force there must be in waves which can lift up such a rock and throw it, and such force as this beats upon our sea coasts and eats away the land. Figure 28 is a sketch on the shores of Arbroth, which I made some years ago. You will not find it difficult to picture to yourselves how the sea has eaten away these cliffs, till some of the strongest pieces which have resisted the waves stand out by themselves in the sea. That cave in the left-hand corner ends in a narrow dark passage, from which you come out on the other side of the rocks into another bay. Such caves as these are made chiefly by the force of the waves in the air, bringing down pieces of rock from under the cliff, and so making a cavity and then, as the waves roll these pieces over and over and grind them against the sides, the hole is made larger. 
There are many places on the English coast where large pieces of the road are destroyed by the crumbling down of cliffs when they have been undermined by caverns such as these. Thus, you see, the whole of the beautiful scenery of the sea, the shores, the steep cliffs, the quiet bays, the creeks and caverns, are all the work of the sculptor water, and he works best where the rocks are hardest for there they offer him a good stout wall to batter, whereas in places where the ground is soft it washes down into a gradual gentle slope, and so the waves come flowing smoothly in and have no power to eat away the shore. And now what has ice got to do with the sculpturing of the land? First we must remember how much the frost does in breaking up the ground. The farmers know this, and always plough after a frost, because the moisture freezing in the ground has broken up the clods and done half their work for them. But this is not the chief work of ice. You will remember how we learned in our last lecture that snow, when it falls on the mountains, gradually slides down into the valleys, and is pressed together by the gathering snow behind, until it becomes molded into a solid river of ice. See figure 29, frontispiece. In Greenland and in Norway there are enormous ice rivers or glaciers, and even in Switzerland some of them are very large. The Aletz Glacier in the Alps is fifteen miles long, and some are even longer than this. They move very slowly, on an average about 20 to 27 inches in the center, and 13 to 19 inches at the sides every 24 hours, in the summer and autumn. How they move we cannot stop to discuss now, but if you will take a slab of thin ice and rest it upon its two ends only, you can prove to yourself that ice does bend, for in a few hours you will find that its own weight has drawn it down in the center, so as to form a curve. This will help you to picture to yourselves how glaciers can adapt themselves to the windings of the valley, creeping slowly onwards until they come down to a point where the air is warm enough to melt them, and then the ice flows away in a stream of water. It is very curious to see the number of little rills running down the great masses of ice at the glacier's mouth, bringing down with them gravel, and every now and then a large stone, which falls splashing into the stream below. If you look at the glacier in the frontispiece, you will see that these stones come from those long lines of stones and boulders stretching along the sides and center of the glacier. It is easy to understand where the stones at the side come from, for we have seen that damp and frost cause pieces to break off the surface of the rocks, and it is natural that these pieces should roll down the steep sides of the mountains onto the glacier. But the middle row requires some explanation. Look to the back of the picture, and you will see that this line of stones is made of two side rows, which come from the valleys above. Two glaciers, you see, have there joined into one, and so made a heap of stones all along their line of junction. These stones are being continually, though slowly, conveyed by the glacier, from all the mountains along its sides down to the place where it melts. Here it lets them fall, and they are gradually piled up till they form great walls of stone, which are called moraines. Some of the moraines left by the larger glaciers of olden time in the country near Turin form high hills, rising up even to fifteen hundred feet. Therefore, if ice did no more than carry these stone blocks, it would alter the face of the country. But it does much more than this. As the glacier moves along, it often cracks for a considerable way across its surface, and this crack widens and widens, until at last it becomes a great gaping chasm, or crevasse as it is called, so that you can look down it right to the bottom of the glacier. Into these crevasses large blocks of rock fall, and when the chasm is closed again as the ice presses on, these masses are frozen firmly into the bottom of the glacier, much in the same way as a steel cutter is fixed in the bottom of a plane. And they do just the same kind of work. For as the glacier slides down the valley, they scratch and grind the rocks beneath them, rubbing themselves away, it is true, but also scraping away the ground over which they move. In this way, the glacier becomes a cutting instrument, and carves out the valleys deeper and deeper as it passes through them. You may always know where a glacier has been, even if no trace of ice remains. For you will see rocks with scratches along them, which have been cut by these stones. And even where the rocks have not been ground away, you will find them rounded like those in the left hand of the frontispiece, showing that the glacier plain has been over them. These rounded rocks are called roche moutonnier because at a distance they look like sheep lying down. You have only to look at the stream flowing from the mouth of a glacier to see what a quantity of soil it has ground off from the bottom of the valley, for the water is thick and colored a deep yellow by the mud it carries. This mud soon reaches the rivers into which the streams run, and such rivers as the Rhone and the Rhine 
are thick with matter brought down from the Alps. The Rhone leaves this mud in the Lake of Geneva, flowing out at the other end quite clear and pure. A mile and a half of land has been formed at the head of the lake since the time of the Romans by the mud thus brought down from the mountains. Thus we see that ice, like water, is always busy carving out the surface of the earth and sending down material to make new land elsewhere. We know that in past ages the glaciers were much larger than they are in our time, for we find traces of them over large parts of Switzerland where glaciers do not now exist, and huge blocks which could only have been carried by ice and which are called erratic blocks, some of them as big as cottages, have been left scattered all over the northern part of Europe. These blocks were a great puzzle to scientific men till, in 1840, Professor Agassiz showed that they must have been brought by ice all the way from Norway and Russia. In those ancient days there were even glaciers in England, for in Cumberland and Wales you may see their work, in scratched and rounded rocks, and the moraines they have left. Lanbaris Pass, so famous for its beauty, is covered with ice scratches, and blocks are scattered all over the sides of the valley. There is one block high up on the right-hand slope of the valley, as you enter from the Bedgalere side, which is exactly poised upon another block, so that it rocks to and fro. It must have been left thus balanced when the ice melted round it. You may easily see that these blocks were carried by ice and not by water, because their edges are sharp, whereas if they had been rolled in water they would have been smoothed down. We cannot here go into the history of that great glacial period long ago, when large fields of ice covered all the north of England. But when you read it for yourselves and understand the changes on the earth's surface which we can see being made by ice now, then such grand scenery as the rugged valleys of Wales, with large angular stone blocks scattered over them, will tell you a wonderful story of the ice of bygone times. And now we have touched lightly on the chief ways in which water and ice carve out the surface of the earth. We have seen that rain, rivers, springs, the waves of the sea, frost, and glaciers all do their part in chiseling out ravines and valleys, and in producing rugged peaks or undulating plains, here cutting through rocks so as to form precipitous cliffs, there laying down new land to add to the flat country, in one place grinding stones to powder, in others piling them up in gigantic ridges. We cannot go a step into the country without seeing the work of water around us. Every little gully and ravine tells us that the sculpture is going on, Every stream, with its burden of visible or invisible matter, reminds us that some earth is being taken away and carried to a new spot. In our little lives we see indeed but the very small changes, but by these we learn how greater ones have been brought about, and how we owe the outline of all our beautiful scenery, with its hills and valleys, its mountains and plains, its cliffs and caverns, its quiet nooks and its grand rugged precipices, to the work of the two great sculptors, water and ice. End of Lecture 5。Lecture 6 of the Fairyland of Science。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashwin Jain. The Fairyland of Science, Lecture Six: The Voices of Nature and How We Hear Them. Week Sixteen. We have reached today the middle point of our course, and here we will make a new start. All the wonderful histories which we have been studying in the last five lectures have had little or nothing to do with living creatures. The sunbeams would strike on our earth, the air would move restlessly to and fro, the water drops would rise and fall, the valleys and ravines would still be cut out by rivers, if there were no such thing as life upon the earth. But without living things there could be none of the beauty which these changes bring about. Without plants, the sunbeams, the air and the water would be quite unable to clothe the bare rocks, and without animals and man they could not produce light or sound or feeling of any kind. In the next five lectures, however, we are going to learn something of the use living creatures make of the earth. 
and today we will begin by studying one of the ways in which we are affected by the changes of nature and hear her voice. We are also accustomed to trust to our sight to guide us in most of our actions and to think of things as we see them that we often forget how very much we owe to sound and yet nature speaks to us much by her gentle, her touching, her awful sounds that the life of a deaf person is even more hard to bear than that of a blind one. Have you ever amused yourself with trying how many different sounds you can distinguish if you listen at an open window in a busy street? You will probably be able to recognize easily jolting of heavy wagon or dray, the rumble of the omnibus, the smooth roll of the private carriage, and the rattle of the light butcher's cart. And even while you are listening for these, the crack of the carter's whip, the cry of the costermonger at his stall, and the voices of the passers-by will strike upon you air. Then, if you give still more close attention, you will hear the doors open and shut along the street, the footsteps of the passengers, the scraping of the shovel of the mud carts. Nay, if you happen to stand near, you may even hear the jingling of the shoe black spins as he plays pitch and toss upon the pavement. If you think for a moment, does it not seem wonderful that you should hear all these sounds so that you can recognize each one distinctly while all the rest are going on around you? But suppose you go into the quiet country, surely there will be silence there. Try some day and prove it for yourself. Lie down on the grass in a sheltered nook and listen attentively. If there be ever so little wind stirring, you will hear it rustling gently through the trees. Or even if there is not this, it will be strange if you do not hear some wandering gnat buzzing or some busy bee humming as it moves from flower to flower. Then a grasshopper will set up a chirp within a few yards of you, or, if all the creatures are silent, a brook not far off may be flowing along with a rippling musical sound. These and a hundred other noises you will hear in a most quiet country spot. The lowing of the cattle, the song of the birds, the squeak of the field mouse, the croak of the frog, mingling with the sounds of the woodman's axe in the distance, or the dash of some river torrent. And beside these quiet sounds, there are still other occasional voices of nature which speak to us from time to time. The howling of the tempestuous wind, the roar of the sea waves in the storm, the crash of thunder, and the mighty noise of the falling avalanche. Such sounds as these tell us how great and terrible our nature can be. Now, has it ever occurred to you to think what sounds is? How is it we hear all these things? Strange as it may seem, if there were no creature that could hear upon the earth, there would be no such thing as sound. Though all these movements in nature were going on just as they are now, Try and grasp this thoroughly, for it is difficult at first to make people believe it. Suppose you were stone deaf, there would be no such thing as sound to you. A heavy hammer falling on an anvil would indeed shake the air violently, but since this air, when it reached your ear, would found a useless instrument, it could not play upon it, and it is this play on the drum of your ear and the nerves within it speaking to your brain which make the sound. Therefore, if all creatures on or around the earth were without ears or nerves of hearing, there would be no instrument on which to play, and consequently there would be no such thing as sound. 
This proves that two things are needed in order we may hear. First, the outside movement which plays on our hearing instrument, and secondly, the hearing instrument itself. First, then, let us try to understand what happens outside our ears. Take a poker and tie a piece of string to it, and holding the ends of the string to your ears, strike the poker against the fender. You will hear a very loud sound. For the blow will set all the particles of the poker quivering, and this movement will pass right along the string to the drum of your ear and play upon it. Now take the string away from your ears and hold it with your teeth. Stop your ears right and strike the poker once more against the fender. You will hear the sound quite as loudly and as clearly as you did before. But this time the drum of your ear has not been agitated. How then has the sound been produced? In this case, the quivering movement has passed through your teeth into the bones of your ear and from them into the nerves and so produced the sound in your brain. And now, as a final experiment, fasten the string to the mantelpiece and hit it against the fender. How much feebler the sound is this time, and how much sooner it stops. Yet still, it reaches you, for the movement has come this time across the air to the drums of your ear. Here we are back again in the land of invisible workers. We have all been listening and hearing ever since we were babies. But have we ever made any picture to ourselves of how sound comes to us right across from a room or field. When we stand at one end and the person who calls is at the other. Since we have studied the aerial ocean, we know that the air filling the space between us, though invisible, is something very real. And now all we have to do is to understand exactly how the movement crosses this air. This we shall do most readily by means of an experiment made by Dr. Tyndall in his lectures on sound. I have heard a number of boxwood balls resting in a wooden tray which has a bell hung at the end of it. I am going to take the end ball and roll it sharply against the rest and then I want you to notice carefully what happens. See, the ball at the other end has flow off and hit the ball, so that you hear it ring. Yet the other balls remain where they were before. Why is this? It is because each of the balls, as it were knocked forwards, had one in front of it to stop it and make it bounce back again. But the last one was free to move on. When I threw this ball from my hand against the others, the one in front of it moved and hitting the third ball, bounced back again and the third did the same to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth and so on to the end of the line. Each ball thus came back to its place and passed the shock on to the last ball and the ball to the bell. If I now put the balls close up to the bell, and repeat the experiment, you still hear the sound, for the last ball shakes the ball as if it were a ball in front of it. Now imagine these balls to be atoms of air, and the bell your air. If I clap my hands and so hit the air in front of them, each air atom hits the next just as the balls did, and though it comes back to its place, it passes the shock on along the whole line of atom touching the drum of your ear, and so you receive a blow. But a curious thing happens in the air which you cannot notice in the balls. You must remember that air is elastic, just as if there were springs between the atoms in the diagram. Figure 31. And so 
when any shock knocks the atoms forward, several of them can be crowded together before they push on those in front. Then, as soon as they have passed the shock on, they rebound and begin to separate again, and so swing to and fro till they come to rest. Meanwhile, the second set will go through just the same movements and will spring apart as soon as they have passed the shock onto a third set. And so you will have one set of crowded atoms and one set of separated atoms alternately all along the line. And the same set will never be crowded two instants together. You may see an excellent example of this in a luggage train in a railway station. When the trucks are left to bump each other till they stop, you will see three or four trucks knocked together. Then they will pass the shock onto the th four in front while they themselves bound back and separate as far as the chains will let them. Next, the four trucks will do the same. And so, a kind of wave of crowded trucks passes onto the end of the train and they bump to and fro till the whole comes to a standstill. Try to imagine a movement like this going on in the line of air atoms, the drum of your air being at the end. Those which are crowded together at the end will hit on the drum of your air and drive the membrane which covers it inwards. Then instantly, the wave will change, these atoms will bound back, and the membrane will recover itself again, but only to receive a second blow as the atoms are driven forwards again, and so the membrane will be driven in and out till the air has settled down. This you see is quite different to the waves of light which moves in crests and hollows. Indeed, it is not what we usually understand by a wave at all, but a set of crowdings and partings of atom of air which follow each other rapidly across the air. A crowding of atoms is called a condensation and a parting is called a rarefaction. And when we speak of the length of a wave of sound, we mean the distance between two condensations or between two rarefactions. Although each atom of air moves a very little way forwards and then back, yet as a long row of atoms may be crowded together before they begin to part, a wave is often very long. When a man talks in an ordinary bass voice, he makes sound waves from 8 to 12 feet long. A woman's voice makes shorter waves from 2 to 4 feet long and consequently the tone is higher, as we shall presently explain. And now I hope that someone is anxious to ask why, when I clap my hands, anyone behind me or the side can hear it as well or nearly as well as you who are in front. This is because I give I shock to the air all round my hands and waves go out on all sides making it or gloves of crowdings and partings, widening and widening away from the clap as circles widen on a pond. Thus the waves travel behind me, above me and on all sides until they hit the walls, the ceiling and the floor of the room, wherever you happen to be the hit upon your air. If you can picture to yourself these waves spreading out in all directions, you will easily see why sound grows fainter at the distance. Just close round my hands when I clap them. There is a small quantity of air and so the shock I give, it is very violent. But as the sound waves spread on all sides, they have more and more air to move. And so the air atoms are shaken less violently and strike with less force on your air. 
if we can prevent the sound wave from spreading, then the sound is not weakened. The Frenchman Biot found that a low whisper can be heard distinctly for a distance of half a mile through a tube because the waves could not spread beyond the small column of air. But unless you speak into a small space of some kind, you cannot prevent the waves going out from you in all directions. Try and imagine that you see these waves spreading all around me now and hitting on your ears as they pass. Then on the ears of those behind you, and on and on in widening globes till they reach the wall. What will happen when they get there? If the walls were thin as a wooden partition is, they would shake it, and it again would shake the air on the other side. And so anyone in the next room would have the sound of my voice brought to their ear. But something more would happen. In any case, the sound waves hitting against the wall will bound back from it just as a ball bounds back when thrown against anything. And so, another set of sound waves reflected from the wall will come back across the room. If these waves come to your ear so quickly that they mix with direct waves, they help to make the sound louder in this room than you would hear in the open air for the ha from my mouth and the second ha from the wall come to your ear so instantaneously that they make one sound. This is why you can often hear better at the far end of a search when you stand against a screen or a wall than when you are halfway up the building nearer to the speaker. Because near the wall, the reflected waves strike strongly on your ear and make the sound louder. Sometimes, when the sound comes from a great explosion, these reflected waves are so strong that they are able to break glass. In the explosion of gunpowder in St. John's Wood, many houses in the back streets and the windows broke, the sound waves bounded off at angles from the walls and struck back upon them. Now suppose the wall were so far behind you that the reflected sound waves only hit upon your ear after those coming straight from me had died away. Then you would hear the sound twice, half from me and half from the wall. And here you have an echo. Ha ha. In order for this to happen in ordinary air, you must be standing at least 56 feet away from the point from which the waves are reflected, for then the second blow will come one tenth of a second after the first one, and this is long enough for you to feel them separately. Miss C. A. Martineau tells a story of a dog which was terribly frightened by an echo, thinking another dog was barking. He ran forward to meet him and was very much astonished when, as he came nearer the wall, the echo ceased. I myself once knew a case of this kind, and my dog, when he could find no enemy, ran back barking till he was at a certain distance off, and then the echo of course began again. He grew so furious at last that we had great difficulty in preventing him from flying at a strange man who happened to be passing at the time. Sound travels at 1120 feet in a second in an air of ordinary temperature and therefore 112 feet in the tenth of a second. Therefore, the journey of 56 feet beyond you to reach the wall and 56 feet to return will occupy the sound wave one tenth a second and separate the two sounds. Sometimes in the mountains, walls of rock 
rise at some distance one behind another and then each one would send back its echo a little later than the rock before it so that the ha which you give will come back as a peal of laughter there is an echo in a woodstock park which repeats the word 20 times again sometimes as in the alps the sound waves coming back rebound from mountain to mountain and are driven backwards and forwards becoming fainter and fainter till they die away these echoes are very beautiful if you are now able to picture to yourselves one set of waves going to the wall and another set returning and crossing them you will be ready to understand something of that very difficult question how is it that we can hear many different sounds at one time and tell them apart have you ever watched the sea when the surface is much ruffled and noticed how besides the big waves of the tide there are numberless smaller ripples made by the wind blowing the surface of the water or the oars of a boat tipping in it or even raindrops falling if you have done this you will have seen all these waves and ripples cross each other and you can follow any one ripple with your eye as it goes on its way undisturbed by the rest or you may make beautiful crossing and recrossing ripples on a pond by throwing on two stones at a little distance from each other and here too you can follow any one wave on to the edge of the pond now just in this way the waves of sound in the manner of moving cross and recross each other you will remember too different sounds make waves of different lengths just as the tide makes a long wave and the rain drops tiny ones therefore each sound falls with its own particular wave upon your ear and you can listen to that particular wave just as you look at one particular ripple and then the sound becomes clear to you all this is what is going on outside your ear but what is happening in your ear itself how do these blows of the air speak to your brain by means of the following diagram figure 33 we will try to understand roughly our beautiful hearing instrument the ear first i want you to notice how beautifully the outside shell or concha as it is called is curved round so that any movement of the air coming to it from the front is caught in it and reflected into the hole of the ear put your finger round your ear and feel how the grisly part is curved towards the front of your head this concha makes a curve much like the curve of a deaf man makes his hand behind his ear to catch the sound animals often have to raise their ears to catch the sound well but ours stand always ready when the air waves have passed in at the hole of your ear they move all the air in the passage which is called the auditory or hearing canal this canal is lined with little hairs to keep out insects and dust and the wax which collects in it serves the same purpose but is too much wax collects it prevents the air from playing well upon the drum and therefore makes you deaf across the end of this canal a membrane or skin called the tympanum is stretched like the parchment over the head of a drum and it is this membrane which moves to and fro as the air waves strike on it a violent box on the air sometimes break this delicate membrane or injure it 
and therefore it is very wrong to hit a person violently on the ear. On the other side of this membrane, inside the ear, there is air which fills the whole of the inner chamber and the tube which runs down into the throat behind the nose and is called the eustachian tube after the man who discovered it. This tube is closed at the end by a valve which opens and shuts. If you breathe out strongly and then shut your mouth and swallow, you will hear a little click in your ear. This is because in swallowing you draw the air out of the eustachian tube and so draw in the membrane which clicks as it goes back again. But unless you do this, the tube and the whole chamber cavity behind the membrane remains full of air. Now as this membrane is driven to and fro by the sound waves, it naturally shakes the air in the cavity behind it. And it also sets moving three most curious little bones. The first of the bones is fastened to the middle of the drum head so that it moves to and fro every time this membrane quivers. The head of this bone fits into a hole in the next bone, the anvil. It is fastened to it by muscles so as to drag it along with it. With the muscles being elastic, it can draw back a little from the anvil and so give it a blow each time it comes back. This anvil is in turn very firmly fixed to the little bone, shaped like a stirrup, which you see at the end of the chain. This stirrup rests upon a curious body, which looks in the diagram like a snail shell, with tubes coming out of it. The body, which is called the labyrinth, is made of bone but it has two little windows in it, one covered only by a membrane, while the other has the head of a stirrup resting upon it. Now, with a little attention you will understand that when the air in the canal shakes the drum head to and fro, this membrane must drag with it the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup. Each time the drum goes in, the hammer will hit the anvil and drive the stirrup against the little window. Every time it goes out, it will draw the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup out again, ready for another blow. Thus, the stirrup is always playing upon this little window. Meanwhile, inside the bony labyrinth, there is a fluid-like water and along the little passages are very fine hairs, which wave to and fro like reeds. And whenever the stirrup hits a little window, the fluid moves these hairs to and fro, and they irritate the ends of a nerve. And this nerve carries the message to your brain. There are also some curious little stones called otoliths lying in some part of this fluid and they by their rolling to and fro probably keeps up the motion and prolong the sound you must not imagine we have explained here the many intricacies which occur in the air i can only hope to give you a rough idea of it so that you may picture to yourselves the air waves moving backwards and forward in the canal of your ear, then the tympanum vibrating to and fro, the hammer hitting the anvil, the stirrup knocking at the little window, the fluid waving the fine hairs and rolling the tiny stones, the ends of the nerve quivering, and then, how we know not, the brain hearing the message. Is not this wonderful going on as it does at every sound you hear? And yet, his is not all. 
for inside that curved part of the labyrinth which looks like a snail shell and is called the cochlea there is a most wonderful apparatus of more than 3000 wine stretch filaments or threads and these act like the strings of a harp and make you hear different tones if you go near to a harp or a piano and sing any particular note very loudly you will hear this note sounding in the instrument because you will set just that particular string quivering which gives the note you sang the air waves said going by your voice touch the string because it can quiver in time with them while none of the other strings can do so now just in the same way the tiny instrument of 3000 strings in your ear which is called cortis organ vibrates to the air waves one thread to the one set of waves and another to another and according to the fiber that quivers will be the sound you hear here then at last we see how nature speaks to us all the movements going on outside however violent and varied they may be cannot of themselves make sound but here in the little space behind the drum of air the air waves are sorted and sent to our brain where they speak to us as sound week 18 but why then do we not hear all sounds as music why are some mere noise and others called musical notes this depends entirely upon whether the sound waves come quickly and regularly or by an irregular succession of shocks for example when a load of stones is being shot out of the cart you hear only a long continuous noise because the stones fall irregularly some quicker some slower here a number together and there are two or three stragglers by themselves each of these different shocks comes to your ear and makes a confused noisy sound but if you run a stick very quickly along a paling you will hear a sound very much like a musical note this is because the rods of the paling are all at equal distances from one another and so the shocks fall quickly one after another at regular intervals on your ear any quick and regular succession of sounds makes a note even though it may be an ugly one the squeak of a slate pencil along a slate and the shriek of a railway whistle are not pleasant but they are real notes which you could copy on a violin i have here a simple apparatus which i have made to show you the rapid and regular shocks produce a natural musical note this wheel figure 24 is milled at the edge like a shilling and when i turn it rapidly so that it strikes against the edge of the card fixed behind it the notches strike in rapid succession and produce a musical sound we can also prove by this experiment that the quicker the blows are the higher the note will be i pull the string gently at first and then quicker and quicker and you will notice that the note grows sharper and sharper till the movement begins to slacken where the note goes down again this is because the more rapidly the air is hit the shorter are the waves it makes and short waves give a high note let us examine this with two tuning forks i strike one and it sounds t the third space in the treble i strike the other and it sounds g 
the first ledger line five nodes above C. I have drawn on this diagram figure 25 an imaginary picture of these two set of waves. You see the G fork makes three waves while the C fork makes only two. Why is this? Because the prong of the G fork moves three times backwards and forwards while the prong of the C fork only moves twice. Therefore the G fork does not crowd so many atoms together before it draws back and the waves are shorter. These two nodes C and G are a fifth on an octave part. If we had two forks of which one went twice as fast as the other making four waves while the other made two then that node would be an octave higher. So we see that all the sounds we hear, the warning noises which keeps us from harm, the beautiful musical notes with all the tunes and harmonies delight us, even the power of hearing the voices of those we love and learning from one another that which each can tell. All these depend upon the invisible waves of air, even as the pleasures of light depend on the waves of ether. It is by these sound waves that nature speaks to us and in all her movements there is a reason why her voice is sharp or tender, loud or gentle, awful or loving. Take for instance the brook we spoke of at the beginning of the lecture. Why does it sing so sweetly while the wild deep river makes no noise? Because the little brook eddies and pulls round the stones, hitting them as it passes. Sometimes the water falls down a large stone and strikes against the water below, or sometimes it grates the little pebbles together as they lie in its bed. Each of these blows make a small globe of sound waves which spread and spread till they fall on your ear and because they fall quickly and regularly they make a low musical note. We might almost fancy the brook wished to show how joyfully it flows along, recalling Shelley's beautiful lines. Sometimes it fell among the moss with hollow harmony, dark and profound, now on the polished stones. It danced like the childhood laughing as it went. The broad deep river, on the contrary, makes none of these cascades and commotions. The only places against which it rubs are the banks and the bottom. And here you can sometimes hear it grating the particles of sand against each other if you listen very carefully. But there is another reason why falling water makes a sound. And often even a loud roaring noise in the cataract and the breaking waves of the sea. You do not only hear the water dashing against the rocky ledges or on the beach, you also hear the bursting of innumerable little bladders of air which are contained in the water. As each of these bladders is dashed on the ground, it explodes and sends sound waves to your ear. Listen to the sea some day. When the waves are high and stormy, you cannot fail to be struck by the irregular bursts of sound. The waves, however, do not only roar as they dash on the ground. Have you ever noticed that they seem to scream as they draw back down the beach? Tennyson calls it the scream of the maddened beach dragged by down by the wave and it is caused by the stones grating against each other as the waves drag them down. 
Dr. Tinder tells us that it is possible to know the size of the stones by the kind of the noise they make. If they are large, it is a confused noise, when smaller, a kind of scream, while a gravely beach will produce a mere hiss. Who could be dull by the side of a brook, a waterfall, or the sea? when he can listen for sounds like these and picture to himself how they are being made. You may discover a number of other causes of sound made by water if you once pay attention to them. Nor is it only water that sings to us. Listen to the wind, how sweetly it sighs among the leaves. There we hear it because it rubs the leaves together and produces the sound waves. But walk against the wind some day, and you can hear it whistling in your own ear, striking against the curved cup, and then setting up a succession of waves in the hearing channel of the ear itself. Why should it sound in one particular tone, when all kinds of sound waves must be surging about in a disturbed air? This glass jar will answer your question roughly. If I strike my tuning fork and hold it over the jar, you cannot hear it because the sound is fuel. But if I fill the jar gently with water, when the water raises to a certain point, you will hear a loud clear note because the waves of air in the jar are exactly the right length to answer the note of the fork. If I now blow across the mouth of the jar, you hear the same note, showing that a cavity of a particular length will only sound to the waves which fit it. So do you now see the reason why pan pipes gave different sounds, or even the hole at the end of a common key when you blew across it? Here is a subject you will find very interesting. If you'll read about it, I can only just suggest it to you here. But now you will see that the candle of your ear also answers to certain waves, and so the wind sings in your ear with a real, if not musical, note. Again, on a windy night, have you not heard the wind sounding a wild, sad note down a valley? Why do you think it sounds so much louder and more musical here than when it is blowing across the plain? Because the air in the valley will only answer to certain set of waves. And like the pan pipe gives a particular note as the wind blows across it. And these waves go up and down the valley in regular pulses, making a wild howl. You may hear same in the chimney or in the keyhole. All these are waves set up in the hole across which the wind blows. Even the music in the shell which you hold to your ear is made by the air in the shell pulsating to and fro. How do you think it is set going? By the throbbing of the veins in your ear which causes the air in the shell to vibrate. Another grand voice of nature is thunder. People often have a vague idea that thunder is produced by the clouds knocking together, which is very absurd if you remember that clouds are but water dust. The most probable explanation of thunder is much more beautiful than this. You will remember from lecture that heat forces the air atoms apart. Now, when a flash of lightning crosses the sky, it suddenly expands the air all around it as it passes, so that the globe after globe of sound waves is formed at every point across which the lightning travels. Now light, you remember, travels so wonderfully rapidly, 192,000 miles in a second, that a flash of lightning is seen by us and is over in a second, even when it is two or three miles long. 
but sound comes slowly, taking 5 seconds to travel half a mile. And so all the sound waves at each point of the 2 or 3 miles fall on our ear, one after the other, and makes the rolling thunder. Sometimes, the roll is made even wronger by the echo, as the sound waves are reflected to and fro by the clouds on the road. In the mountains we know the peals of echo and reco till they die away. We might fill up far more than an hour in speaking of those voices which come to us as nature is at work. Think of the patter of the rain, how each drop as it hits the pavement sends circles of sound waves out on all sides, or the loud report which falls on the air of the alpine traveler as the glacial cracks on the, its way down the valley, or the mighty boom of the avalanche as the snow slides its huge masses on the side of the lofty mountain. Each and all of these create their sound waves, large or small, loud or feeble, which make their way to your ear and become converted into sound. We have, however, only time now just to glance at live sounds, of which there are so many around us. Do you know why we hear a buzzing, as a gnat, the bee, or the cock chafter fly past, not by the beating of their wings against the air, as many people imagine, and as is really the case with hummingbirds, but by the scraping of the underpart of their hard wings against the edges of their hind legs, which are toothed like a saw. The more rapidly their wings move, the stronger the grating sound becomes, and you will now see why in hot, thirsty weather the buzzing of the gnat is so loud, for the more thirsty and the more eager he becomes, the wilder his movements will be. Some insects, like the drone fly, Aristalistenex, force the air through the tiny air passages in the sides. And as these passages are closed by little plates, the plates vibrate to and fro and make sound waves. Again, what are those curious sounds you may hear sometimes if you rest your head on a trunk in the forest? They are made by the timber boring beetles which saw the wood with their jaws and make a noise in the world even though they have no voice. All these life sounds are made by creatures who do not sing or speak, but the sweetest sounds of all in the woods are the voices of our birds. All voice sounds are made by two elastic bands or cushions called vocal cords, stretched across the end of the tube or windpipe through which we breathe. And as we send the air through them, we tighten or loosen them as we will, and so make them vibrate quickly or slowly, and make sound waves of different lengths. But if you will try some day in the woods, you will find that a bird can speed you over and over again in the length of its note. When you are out of breath and forced to stop, he will go on with his merry trill as fresh and clear as if he had only just begun. This is because birds can draw air into the whole of their body and they have a large stock laid up in the folds of their windpipe. And besides this, the air chamber behind the elastic bands or vocal cords has two compartments where we have only one and the second compartment as special muscles by which they can open and shut it, and so prolong the trill. Only think what a rapid succession of waves must quiver through the air 
as a tiny lark agitates his little throat and pours forth a volume of song. The next time you are in the country in the spring, spend half an hour listening to him and try and picture to yourself how that little being is moving all the atmosphere around him. Then dream for a little while about sound, what it is, how marvelously it works outside in the world and inside in your ear and brain. And then, when you go back to work again, you will hardly deny that it is well worth while to listen sometimes to the voices of nature and ponder how it is that we hear them. End of Lecture 6 Recording by Ashwin